wonderful? Yes. There's our choir. It's so fabulous. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. I am so happy to be with you today. I'm Reverend Carol Huntley, and I would like to welcome everybody, and especially anyone who is here for the first time. We have some information packets, and there's a little card for you to fill out so that we uh, know how you found us. And if you check on that card that you would like to get emails from us, then you will. Uh, and you'll get to know what's going on in the community. So right now, if you are here for the first time, we would love to welcome you and give you a packet. All you have to do is raise your hand. That's all we'll ask you to do. There's one right there and another one right there. And you were just scratching. Okay, good, <laughs> good. <laughs> Great. All right. Um, so here we are, my loves. Uh, the theme for the whole year is a hundred years of science of mind. And like other metaphysical traditions, there are two main themes that have been in this wisdom tradition as in other metaphysical traditions. And those two main themes are, I call them, oneness and mastery. That those two ideas, that all of life is one and that we have a lot to say about what our life is like, oneness and mastery, are the underlying every lesson, every truth, every prayer, every, um, er every choice we make. Uh, it, the philosophy is simple, it is profound, and it is very, very workable. And um, for example, it, it is in our April theme. The April theme is where humanity and divinity meet. Well, that's oneness, where humanity and divinity meet. And then mastery is that junction between humanity and eternity. When, when you think about divinity and eternity being kind of the same kinds of things, then you get the topic for me today, which is eternity is our constant companion. So I want to direct your attention to this beautiful, beautiful altar that Janet Ryan did. Um, it, it has some symbols of the immortal, the eternal, the tree of life, this wonderful uh, Kuan Yin or Buddha, and then this little card that says, walking a sacred path. And so I just thank Janet for her beautiful, beautiful altar that fits right in. So I want to, uh, the, the title could be a lot of things, but what the talk is about is about death. Uh, I had, you know, when I, I announced that I was going to be leaving and retiring um, at the end of July, I made the offer that anybody who wanted anything from me as far as a workshop, a, and by the way, they're right on the back here, the workshops and the giveaways, don't read it now, but um, I, I said I would do it. And so it was actually Jay Gustafson who said, I would really love to hear a talk about death because um, he just wanted it. And, um, and, you know, so today is Jean Langell's memorial service, and I know many of us are going to that. And so I thought it would be a beautiful and perfect time for me to talk about this topic, which is really one of my favorites. It is um, intimate and personal and um, heart-opening. Uh, and it's a universal experience, and it's one that a lot of us are uncomfortable with. I was uncomfortable with it. Um, and then after almost 30 years of being a minister and being with several people who, who as they made their transition, um, I've gotten to really like the whole thing, the whole plan. And that's what I would like to share with you today. And those two lessons that I talked about, oneness and mastery, oneness and mastery is about life and death is a part of life. And oneness works in with that idea that we are one with God now and then and always. We always have been one with God. The divinity that is within us doesn't leave us. And mastery, we have a lot to say about our own death. And, all, and this wonderful, wonderful song that we just heard, we don't know how, we don't know why, we don't know when, we don't. You know, if I asked all of you, do you know how, where, why, when it's going to happen for you, you would say, ah, no. 
but we have a lot to say about how we want it, and that is the mastery part. So the science of mind teaching is that we are immortal right now. And what that means is, to me, because, you know, all I'm saying is what I kind of intuit and know because I have not been on the other side that I can recall, although I know I came from there. So that's the thing about immortality. We were immortal before we took this body. We are immortal now. And we are immortal after we lay the body down. So we clothed ourselves in flesh and and then we, then we lay the flesh down. And I made this saying up, but I love it. Everybody gets through death alive and well. <laughs> I know that to be true. I absolutely know it to be true. So um, there's this little part, I, and I refer all of you to the chapter in the textbook on immortality. It is an amazing treatise. So on page 376, Ernest Holmes has talked about the part in the Bible that says there are celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. And then there is this amazing paragraph. It would seem then that we have a spiritual body now and need not die to receive one. Um, so it looks as if we were already immortal and need not die to take on immortality. If there are many planes of life and consciousness, as we firmly believe, perhaps we only die from one plane to another. This thought makes a strong appeal and seems reasonable. So that's the teaching. Stephen Levine, who wrote many, many books on death, he's really a midwife. I, actually, he died in 2016, so he knows what he's talking about now. Um, <laughs> So th this is what he said, I love this. There is no other preparation for death except opening to the present. If you are here now, you'll be there then. <laughs> How reassuring. If I'm here now, I'll be there then. Yeah, yeah, I'm here, I'm, I'm me, and I'm, I'll still be here. So most of us, I think, cannot really know what happens after we take that last breath. Some have had the experience of being contacted by loved ones. Some have had visions of going into the light. Some have had a near-death experience. But all of this is so uh, anecdotal. Even the, even the books that are written about life after death, it's story after story after story. And so honestly, when it happens to us, it comes down to faith. Actually, this I wasn't going to say this, but it just came to me. Any of us who, have, who are mothers, remember that time before your first pregnancy? If you were like me, you read every single thing you could possibly read about childbirth because you'd never gone through it, and it's kind of scary, right? So you'd read, and you'd try to think what it might be like, and then you get it. <laughs> and it's more... It's just more than you can ever imagine. And so we can read all of these great stories about going into the light, and I think it's better than we can ever tell a story about. So what it comes down to is really our deepest knowing about life is what we think about death. And that is, the questions are, is it safe? Is it good? Is there something for us in this experience? And if we can say yes to those questions, we're a long way down the pathway of being okay with death. So what I want to do today, I, I, you know, is go as deep as I can, as quick as I can, and answer to the best of my ability two questions. And the two questions are, how can I let go of my fear of death? And how can I let go of the fear of someone else's death? And if we can all do that together, we are going to be shining lights in this world. And we are going to walk our life path with such a fearlessness and certainty that, um, that we will be beacons for others. So you ready to do this with me? Yeah. All right. Okay, good, 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 good. So here we go. How can I let go of my fear of my death? 
and you can let go of your fear of your death if you have any. And it might be lurking, even if you think, oh, I'm fine. So um, what we do is we nurture a few beliefs. And the first belief that we nurture is that life is for you. This is the entire teaching of Science of Mind, is that life is really on our side. And all that we are given is for our blessing. Nothing is given to us to annoy us. Nothing is given to us just for our suffering. Um, everything is presented to us as a gift. And so there are lots of ways to see all the gifts that we have. We have lots of love in our life. We have lots of support from one another. We are given intelligence. We are given feedback in life. As we walk down this path, we are given feedback that, no, let's not go down that path. That is not working. So we correct and we go back and that's a gift. Life is not haphazard, and the deepest qualities of life are always available. The deepest qualities of love and peace and joy are always available. And because death happens to everyone, it seems to be a part of life, and therefore it must be beneficial. We're all going there. You know this, right? We are all on the pathway. And we're, we're going to go in order. In this room, there's... This one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. All of us in a little parade through the doorway, exactly on time. So one of the things I thought about at this point as I was making my talk is a Dalai Lama's um, saying about his religion. He said, my religion is kindness. And I have always interpreted that as the Dalai Lama believes that when we are kind to others, we are living a spiritual life. But at this point, I got another realization, and that is life is kind to us. This is the universe in which I believe that I live, that life is kind to me. Now, this can be tricky because... Um, we have this mastery part, you know, that I, the oneness and the mastery part. And the mastery part is, it is done unto you as you believe. And so when things happen in life that you don't like, you either, or I, have either doubted the, the truth of that statement from the Bible or doubted my belief um, to be able to work it. So this is really the biggest leap of faith that Science of Mind asks us to make, and that is that truly it is done unto us as we believe. And of course, I know that that begs us all into saying, well, what about bad surprises? And what about if death is a bad surprise? And, and when we go to looking for the bad surprises in our life, we can feel like victims, but there's another way to see every single circumstance, and it was given to me on Facebook this morning. <laughs> it was a meme that said, from life, this is a meme from life, I will make you happy, but first, I will make you strong. <laughs> yeah. So what if all the bad surprises, rightly used, were to make us strong? so that we can be happy. And that happiness takes us right through the doorway. So next is nurture the belief that you have a choice in everything. So I have thought about how I want my death. I want my children there, and I want my husband there, and that's all I want. I don't want y'all. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I love you. And, and, and because it is so intimate, because it is the birth into the next plane, as I believe, I want my precious ones there as I was there for my mom. So I want to tell you about some choices that I made as my mom um, got to the end of her life. Um, 
she weakened and was in the hospital several times with pneumonia and some other things uh, through two or three years before she passed. And during that time, I, was, I had started making my trip. She died in 2008. And before that, um, I was taking these trips to uh, the British lands. And I would be scared that she would die when I was gone. I, I would be scared that she would go in the hospital when I was gone. And it didn't happen enough. I mean, she would go into the hospital right after I got back. But it didn't happen enough that, uh, that there was a crisis when I was gone that I said, oh, I see how it's going to be. It's going to be just as we want it. And it was. We wanted to be together. And it was so precious because she passed at 2 AM on between a Monday and a Tuesday, very, very early on a Tuesday morning. And she was going. She was in the process of dying on the Saturday. And she said to me on the Saturday, she said, I want to go to church with you. And I said, Mom, I think you're too weak to go to church. And she said, well, I want to be with you right up until the end. And that's what told me that the end was near. And what I did was I called Judith Fleener, <laughs> and I said, will you speak for me tomorrow? My mother is dying. <sighs> Thank you, Judith. And she waited for Michael to come. Because right after I called Judith, I called Michael, her grandson. And I said, Nana is probably dying, and you need to get here. And he got there as absolutely soon as he could, which was Monday afternoon. And she waited. She waited until she could um, see him before she went over. So we have a lot to say a lot of choices in this. It doesn't have to just, you don't have to leave it and just say, well, whatever, you know? We, what the teaching is you have a lot of choice in how your life works. And death is a part of life, and you have a choice in that. I want to encourage you to think about how you want it. Next is nurture the belief that there are incomparable blessings in the next phase of life. Get rid of anything that says to you there's going to be punishment, or that there's going to be a void, or that the lights go out. You know, this is not useful. It scares you. And there's no need to scare you. So I want to read to you, um, first of all, I want to say this is the book, um, Anamkara is the book that I took to um, the nursing home where my mom was dying. And I wrote, I took dictation. I took down what she said, her last things that she said. Because I wanted to read this book because it's so wise. So listen to this. I'm going to, I read this at every memorial service. If you come to Jean's memorial, you're going to hear it twice. So this is what it says about the other side. John O'Donohue, uh, Irish mystic. It is strange and a magical fact to be here, walking around in a body. The more lonely side of being here is our separation in the world. When you live in a body, you feel separate from every other object and person. Many of our attempts to pray, to love, and to create are secret attempts at transfiguring that separation in order to build bridges outwards so that others can reach us and we can reach them. At death, this physical separation is broken. The soul is released from its particular and exclusive location in the body the soul then comes into a free and fluent universe of spiritual belonging. Wow. <laughs> that sounds really good to me. <laughs> really, really good. 
And so I expect, just like the childbirth experience for me, I ex expect this aspect of life to be more wonderful than I can imagine. And I'm reading all this stuff about how wonderful it can be. So here's another thing that I say at every single memorial that I do, and that is there is nothing wrong here. No matter what happens, um, no matter uh, how the transition occurs, the death occurs, this is a wonderful belief to nurture. And uh, I want to get into it by uh, thinking about how its opposite is impossible. If you can look at someone who is dying or, or um, having just made that transition and, and think, oh, this is really bad, this, something is wrong here, then the wrongness, I think, is your thinking. Because within the allness of God that Posey prayed into so beautifully, nothing bad can really happen. Nothing bad can really happen. We are just going to another place in God. There is nothing fundamentally wrong about any soul's path. Now, sometimes you have to look at that statement from 10,000 feet up, but I absolutely believe that, that in a soul's path, there are no fundamental errors or mistakes. It is all what that soul needs at that time. Something bad cannot happen. God cannot forget us and go, oh, wow, what happened to him? You know, that's not going to happen. So... We are encouraged to think all kinds of scary things about death because when you hear of somebody famous that died, you know, they say they lost their battle with cancer or they succumbed. That after a good fight, they lost the fight. What? After doing whatever their soul needed to do on this plane, they went home. They went home to that free and fluent soul experience in the universe. Finally... This is a healing process. This whole idea of looking at death in a positive way. Um, it has taken me years. And, and it was with a great way shower in my mom that got me here. And the healed place looks like peace and acceptance. And that this is the best thing that could have happened at this time to this person. And I absolutely believe that. And I have, I have been with many of our people as they passed. And um, to a person, it is peaceful and beautiful. So take a deep breath. This is, this is what I thought we all need to work on when we heal the fear of our own death. So now let's look at how you can let go of the fear of someone else's death. And you need to nurture the belief that, first of all, their timing is their timing. There's nothing wrong with when anyone goes. No matter how long they have lived in their body or what they have done or what they think they have left undone, I remember one of the first, the first young men that died of AIDS in about 1984 that I knew. And at that time, they went so fast, if you remember. He got sick very quickly. He was very young. And he said to me, I wish I had learned to golf. And, you know, I just asserted. I said, you know... I bet you'll get a chance on the other side. Now, I have no idea if there's golf over there, but I had that. There's something as good as golf. There is something as good as golf for him. And so um, there's nothing that we can do to hurry people up or hold people back. Their timing is their timing then this is really big, and that is there are gifts in grief. <sighs> How many of you have had your heart ripped open and it stayed open? Look at you people. Absolutely. Grief rips us open, and if we work at it, we can keep that open heart 
so that we are available for compassion and connection with others. Grief is tenderizing. It is, it's like you, you get pounded and you're never quite as tough as before. You get strong and then you get happy. But here's a big thing about grief. Pure grief is beautiful. It is honoring. It is using your heart well. But grief and guilt or grief and regret is hell. It's awful. And so, to heal your fear of someone else's death, you need to heal with them so that there is no guilt or remorse or regret to mix in with your good grief. <clears throat> the next uh, belief to nurture is that living full out is the thing to do. Honesty, forthrightness, forgiveness, appreciation, so that nothing is ever left unsaid, so that the grief can be pure, and you feel that you have given everything you can in this relationship and have received everything that you can. That's important. And finally, to know, and I really know this, that you will be together in the same dimension again. When my mom was near the end, you know, she did believe in reincarnation. Um, and, um, and I said, Mom, if you are in another body and I still need you, and then the question was going to be, do you think that you can be in more than one place at a time? And I didn't even get the question out. She said, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So I felt her presence so often. And I know she's off doing something else. She's not just hanging around me. She did that her whole life on this plane. She's got more things to do, but I still have her some of the time. I know that. So this, I think, is what we do to heal our fear of somebody else dying. So there's one more piece I want to do with you, and that is how to prepare for a good death. So I got this wonderful email from Brent this week. Brent is a hospital chaplain, and he wrote me this. I read once that we die as we live. In my work, I have found this to be a fairly accurate statement. Those who have led a fearful life approach death in the same manner. Those who are anxious experience tremendous anxiety as death approaches. Those who live their lives in joy and serenity, more than likely they will die that way. Those whose lives are filled with adventure and discovery look forward to even grander adventures beyond the veil. What does that say about preparing for death? It means letting go of all of our fears. So I want to tell you a story that uh, this story came to me uh, through Jane Jennings, and um, she was practicing one of the classes that I taught years ago, and she said, I have a wonderful story about a very good death. She, she you know, is a former Catholic, um, maybe a nun. Was she ever a nun? She thought, thought about it, I guess. Anyway, this was a Catholic lady who every day of her life prayed for a good death, among other things. She was very prayerful, but from a young person, a young person, she prayed every day for a good death. So in her life, she had a lovely long life. She married, they, she had a long marriage, she had children, she and her husband lived a long life, and along in their 90s or so, the husband died. Every day she's praying for her good death and her husband dies. So she still prays for her good death, and as the story goes, she went shoe shopping. I don't, it's kind of interesting that it's shoe shopping for the journey um, <laughs> with her daughter, and she lived alone, and she came home, and she felt that it was her time. And so she called the paramedics, 
And she said, I believe I'm dying. Don't hurry. <laughs> she said, the door will be unlocked and I'll be here. <laughs> so sirens blazing, they arrive in minutes and crash through the door as they're wont to do. And in her bedroom with the lamp on was the sweet lady sitting in her chair having passed. She sat down and went over. She had prayed for a good death her whole life. So the next thing is allow death's presence to help you prioritize. So Stephen Levine says, when you start using death as a means of focusing on life, then everything becomes just as it is, just this moment, an extraordinary opportunity to be really alive. And Desmond Tutu wrote, when you have a potentially terminal disease, it concentrates the mind wonderfully. It gives new intensity to life. You discover how many things you have taken for granted the love of your spouse, the Beethoven symphony, the dew on the rose, the laughter on the face of your grandchild. And what I would like to add is you don't have to wait until there is some terminal thing going on. We can just remember the number of breaths I have is countable. And so the breaths that I take today must be for good. And then this very wonderful advice, keep communication open and complete. Reveal your heart and don't hold anything back. And then finally, expect the best time you ever had. So my mom, once she went through that time of, of depression, of, about dying, she was a happy girl. And on the last morning of her life, this was Monday morning, uh, she said, I know how wonderful I am because I received so much. She said this, I wrote it down. And she said this with this beatific look on her face, like she was already seeing the other side and just giving it just thanks for what was on this side. So, getting back to oneness and mastery. You are one with God. I am one with God. I am one with you, always and forever. And each one of us has great choices to make in making our death a good one. And this helps us all feel so, so masterful. I want to close before the inner work by reading a blessing from John O'Donohue. And uh, just take this in, and then we'll go right into prayer. I pray that you will have the blessing of being consoled and sure about your own death. May you know in your soul that there is no need to be afraid. When your time comes, may you be given every blessing and shelter that you need. May there be a beautiful welcome for you in the home that you are going to. You are not going somewhere strange. You are going back to the home that you never left. May you have a wonderful urgency to live your life to the full. May you live compassionately and creatively and transfigure everything that is negative within you and about you. When you come to die, May it be after a long life. May you be peaceful and happy and in the presence of those who really care for you. May your going be sheltered and your welcome assured. And may your soul smile in the embrace of your infinite friend. And as we go into prayer with those sweet wishes on our heart, and as the practitioners surround us in this beautiful chalice of care, feel the ancestors. The north is right behind me. All of your ancestors, because of our talk of the doorway today, are right there smiling at you. 
through soft eyes, you might look behind me and see your ancestors. They will prepare the way for you as you join them in the realm of ancestry. It will be at the perfect time and in the perfect way. Your path will be filled with love and lit with divine light. You will know that you were well used in this life and you go back home to that place where new choices can be made. It will be beautiful. It will be loving. It will be more than we hope for because it is going home. In the meantime, I bless our pathways and all that there is still left to do here. And so it is. singers that we love as we sing our lives away and though we all fall silent in the end they will sing with us forever they'll be singing every day when we sing the songs they sang and the song goes on in the songs we sing and when one song ends then another song begins so the singers who are gone will be singing once again when we sing the songs they sang. Some are heard by many and some are heard by few and though we all fall silent in the end, someone will remember both the song you sang and you when they sing the songs you sang. For the song goes on in the songs we sing. And when one song ends, then another song begins. So the singers who have gone will be singing once again when we sing the songs they sang. Sing the chorus, sing the song. When the singers gone before us will be singing right along. Sing the, chorus, sing the chorus and refrain. And, refrain. and the singers and gone before and us will be singing once refrain. again. We can drive away the silence of the grave that we all fear, though we all fall silent in the end. Sing and you'll be singing with the singers you hold dear when we sing the songs they sang. For the song goes on in the songs we sing and when one song ends, then another song begins. So the singers who have gone will be singing once again when we sing the songs they sang. So if you sing along, you bring along the singers who are gone, and though we all fall silent in the end, sing and you'll be singing both the singer and the song when we sing the songs they sang. For the song goes on in the songs we sing, and when one song ends, then another song begins. So the singers who are gone will 
we'll be singing once again when we sing the songs they sang. Sing the chorus, sing the songs, and the singers gone before us will be singing right along. Sing the chorus and refrain, and the singers gone before us